it's snowy. So pretty. Never see snow in North Carolina anymore. Hardly. What do you have? Snow? Did it? Yeah. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Charlotte, the trauma-informed teacher. The purpose of my channel is to help teachers find a good balance between self-care and career growth. You know, so many of us are focused on our students and their needs all the time. It's a wonderful profession um, because you get to actually see an impact that you're making on the lives of students. But in the middle of that, we still have families, we still have personal needs, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves before we try to take care of others. Today, I'm gonna to be taking you through how I plan a unit of instruction. I'm actually getting ready to go back to school. Um, on February the 16th, we're bringing our students back. We were face-to-face -face for a short time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then due to a spike, we came back um, to virtual after the holidays. And now we are coming back in person again um, with some changes. Before we were going two days a week only um, with a hybrid schedule and we are doing half days till one o'clock. And now we're gonna be um, three days a week. So that'll be a little bit different. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But um, I am actually trying to figure out what is the best way for me to make the, the most use of my time over the next week. And what do I want to hold off on um, to do in person with students? Being that I'm a science teacher, um, it's very important for me to be able to offer students hands-on opportunities whenever I can. So we're kind of in a, um, a good place right now, actually, for transitioning. All three of my classes are in a place where we're ready to start a new unit or getting close to ready, um, be ready to start a new unit. My sixth graders and eighth graders actually just took their test on their other unit. So the challenge for me right now is what do I need to do first in the first week to get them set up and what kinds of opportunities will I be able to offer them in person once they get back on the 16th. So I have like six days of instruction before my students return face to face. So let me walk you through this. Let's get started. So whenever I start a new unit of instruction, I always like to start with the standards, obviously. Um, if I share my screen, I will show you the standards that we're currently working with. I'm in North Carolina, um, so the whole state is on the same standards. Um, we use the North Carolina Essential Standards for Science. Um, we are looking at transitioning to the NGSS, but that won't be until I think it's 20, I want to say 2026 that North Carolina is talking about adopting the NGSS. I do always cross reference with the NGSS because it's just so pertinent to what we do with 21st century learning. Um, so it's always important for me to look at those engineering and um, mathematics practices and things like that um, in the literacy component when I'm planning, but I've start off here. So right now I'm planning a unit for sixth grade 
It's my unit on energy conservation and transfer, which mostly is composed of thermal energy, um, but it also includes some things about electromagnetic waves. This part right here, I'm not going to lie, I did not get to cover last year. Um, it, it just didn't work out um, for me last year to get to that. So since this is only my second year um, teaching this grade level and this subject area um, for middle grades, I was an ELA teacher first. Um, I'm still learning my way, and so I'm going to be looking for some activities today that go with that. Um, I have showed you in some of my previous videos how I use a standards breakdown form to dissect the standards. So I'm not going to do that here, but I will link um, in the description box, and also I'll put a card up in the corner. You can click on that and watch my other videos of how I use the standards breakdown to start my units. Um, but I'm going to begin from there, and basically what I like to do is I create a web that includes the standards for the unit and then I just start lift, listing off all these different ideas that are off the top of my head that come to me for um, showing the different things that students will be tested on in that standard. I always dissect the standard based on the verbs that they need to be able to do for performance assessment purposes, and that helps me design my assessments. And then from there, I go backwards and create activities that will help students be able to successfully complete that performance assessment. So I use backward design, if you've ever heard of that before, starting with the test, working backwards to the activities, um, which is why I really find it helpful to look at the language of the standard um, when I'm planning because the words are right there for you. So like for example, um, in this standard, illustrate the transfer of heat energy from warmer objects to cooler ones using examples of conduction, radiation, and convection, and the effects that may result. So my operative word here is that students are going to have to illustrate. Um, that takes different forms on an assessment like at the state level a lot of times it's like I'm going to give you a picture tell me which one of those things it is um, so students need to be able to work back and forth between drawing and also recognizing drawings diagrams pictures um, of these different things and what are we learning about we're learning about these are our um, nouns that we need to know our vocabulary conduction radiation and convection and then also they need to be able to um, work with the effects of those three things so they have to illustrate both heat transfer of thermal energy basically is what we're talking about even though they didn't say that in the standard that's what it is it's thermal energy transfer and effects of thermal energy transfer in all three forms so when I go to um, write out my web um, I'm going to look at what does illustrate mean, okay, what kind of performance assessment would they have at the end of that. Um, they need to be able to identify pictures that would match those three terms. They need, so it might help them to do an activity where they make a book. Um, it could be a digital book or it could be a paper book. Sometimes it's nice to get students off of the computers right now, um, as I'm sure a lot of you have been doing. I've seen a lot of things on um, the accounts I follow on Instagram and some other teacher YouTubers that, you know, it, it's nice to assign off-screen work right now when the students are glued to the screen all day long um, normally. So making an actual physical book out of paper, most students have some kind of paper they can use at home, as long as you're not too particular about what they use. And you can show them different ways of putting that together. Um, that could be an option um, for them to do that. But also, I want to think about what are some hands-on things that I can have them do so that they have that like physical memory of what these things are about. And then they can draw the representation of it. Um, so working towards that. Um, you know, the drawing is not as tangible as doing the actual experiment. So we want to work them from that manipulative stage to the stage where they have abstract representation. That's what they're going to be tested on. Um, some other things that come to mind here are like graphic design. So digital books or digital designs that show these points would work for it too. Okay, um, so then I just start listing off the different things that I might do. And, you know, last year I did get to cover the standard, so I already have some ideas that worked in the class. Um, last year I 
used um, butter melting and sugar melting as an activity that they did like with hot plates um, to show conduction. And then um, one thing that came to my mind also is, you know, most students have like a can of soup at home um, or even just a can of anything that they could heat in the house. Um, if we were in class, I could obviously set that up to where students could do that one student per table at a time where they would be able to see conduction in action. And then convection, last year I popped popcorn. In fact, I think last year I actually popped popcorn three ways to do this. So um, the first way by conduction was in the actual pan over the stove. And I used a hot plate, but I, I showed them how to, you know, shake the popcorn um, and have it touching, the pot actually touching the hot surface. And we talked about how that's conduction because the heat's transferring from the pot. And for convection, I used a, an air popper. Um, actually, conduction and convection are both shown there, but it does show how the warm air rises and the popcorn is blown up in that popper. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's a pretty good way to show them convection. Other things that I've done, I like the beaker experiment, or you could use um, canning jars instead, um, where you have the hot water and the cold water, and you show how, you know, if you put the hot water on top, they stay separated. If you flip it upside down, the cold water is dense, so it falls. So that's a good way to show thermal energy as well. Then we have radiation. Um, radiation, I microwaved popcorn last year, but also you can talk about like the, your fireplace or if students go camping, then you know that's radiant heat off of the campfire, the sun's rays, all of those things would represent radiation. So that's what I have, first of all, and those are just the ideas off the top of my head, some of the things that I've done in the past. Um, but after I write all the ideas out of the things that I already can think of to do, then I'm going to start searching online and see what else I can find that I might add that I like um, for either the assessments or the classroom activities. Now for these three standards, I have like two to three weeks to cover it. So right now, um, the first thing that I did uh, in class with those students to introduce the unit is I gave them this um, activity. It's called Don't Melt the Ice. Because I like to use discovery learning in my class where I don't teach, a lot of, a lot of teachers will teach everything out of the book first and then have the students do an experiment. I don't do that. I usually start with the experiment where they have no idea what's going on and then that allows them to construct some of their own ideas and then I can fill in the gaps. I can do some direct teaching and I have their attention. Once I've started out with something that they're interested in and that they are involved in physically, then usually I can grab their attention enough that they're going to want to know why that worked and then they'll pay attention for some you know, short mini lessons of direct instruction on that topic. So here's the don't melt the ice experiment. The object of this is for students to design some sort of insulated container. Um, I told them it can't be like totally man-made, like you can't just use a cooler. That's what a lot of them will try to do. You can't just stick your ice cube outside. Um, you can't just, you know, put it in a thermos. You have to actually use some sort of material around it to insulate it. So then we're actually kind of talking about energy transfer, we're talking about conduction, and we're also talking about um, conductors and insulators as far as suitable materials for design for, for different purposes. So we're sort of dipping into all of our standards um, as we do this. We don't get to actually the electromagnetic waves part, but our standard um, first and third standard of this unit, we dip into it when we do that activity. So I'm having students start off with that. And then of course I have six days. So students were supposed to work on this um, today and on Monday we were supposed to talk about our designs and maybe like play around with testing the different ones at the same time if students bring what they're supposed to bring to class on Monday. So I've got Monday kind of figured out, but then I have to figure out four days. Three of those will be synchronous learning with um, a 30 minute class time. 
and one of those days will be asynchronous learning. So I need to figure that out. I'm looking at the things like um, convection. Convection is probably going to be easier to teach in person and I might be able to do some radiation teaching with a microwave, but I don't know if all my students are going to have the microwave. So I might have to have them do it while I demo. Um, and also I don't know if students um, would have the things that they would need to put in the microwave to show this. So like not every kid's going to have popcorn, you know, at home. And I'm definitely not going to ask parents to go out and buy it. So... I think conduction is going to be my easiest one to do next week, but I don't want to spend, I don't know, I don't want to spend three weeks on conduction, convection, radiation. It's too long. They have been barely introduced um, to these topics, I believe, in fifth grade science. Um, I don't even, I have to check and see in the standards if it's even part of the standards for fifth grade science, but we have an awesome science teacher at our elementary school, and she always sort of taps into the next level a little bit. So when my kids come to me in sixth grade, they have already heard of a lot of the things that I have to teach them simply because she just preps them for it. Even if it's just a quick, like, okay, you're going to learn this next, or here's another concept that's called this. So they've at least heard of a lot of the things. And sometimes she's actually done some things above and beyond the, the ceiling of her curriculum that feed beautifully into mine. So I'm very lucky. Um, but I just have the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade standards up here. So I don't know at the moment if they have actually done this. But I know I don't need three weeks on that. I need three weeks on the entire unit um, so that we can get through the other units that we need to cover. So if I can spend like two weeks on this, that would be great. I'm thinking what might be nice is since our students have been remote for so long, I'm thinking it might be nice if I could teach the lesson in small groups while my students are working on like doing stations for the like practice experiments. But if I do that, then I have to have experiments for conduction, convection, and radiation that they can manage on their own without me having to stand there and make sure that they're following the safety procedures. Some of the things that I did before um, will not work. I'm trying to think. I think that um, when I did this before, I had them melting things on the hot plate. I don't want them working with a hot plate unless I'm right there. I guess if it was only like one student at a time, I could position myself so that the group that I was working with was right by the hot plate so that I could see what was going on and talk to them about what they were doing. Um, but I never want to have a hot plate activity going on without me being close by just because it's sixth grade. <laughs> and, you know, so that might work. So I'll position myself in the back of the room. I'll set up the hot plate like behind me. I have a counter with um, a power strips across the back where the sinks are. And there's plenty of counter space in between each sink. And so I'll have students doing that back there where I can keep an eye on them. That's what I'm going to do. And then maybe the other days of the week, um, next week, since I'm going to have some leftover days after they do their three days of activities, maybe I can have them spend like two of the days next week um, working on doing like their book. I think I'm going to have that. I like that idea, having them make a book. Um, to show the different terms. So once we've done a few things, then they can pick their favorites to show illustrations of each one and then just put a simple definition in there of what it is. So that's where I'm going with that. All right, so I need to look right now for any other thermal energy demos and I need to look for um, information on um, the standard that's about electromagnetic waves and information on material suitability for technology designs. I'm going to start over here. Um, we have Go Open NC in North Carolina. And 
I want to um, type in thermal energy and science. Grade six. All right, search. We'll see what will come up. This is, remember last summer when I told you that I was working on some lessons for um, a lesson repository for teachers in North Carolina? This is what I was doing. I was working on lesson plans to go into here. Um, and so now I'm looking through some other teachers. Heat and thermal energy transfer. Illustrate transfer of heat energy from warmer objects to cooler ones. All right, this is a PBL activity. Hands on. Assessment options, strategies for differentiation. View resource. Temperature scales, heat, and thermal energy transfer. And you know, I noticed that in my seventh grade unit on weather, that um, my students didn't really know a lot about um, like the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water, um, which is important to being able to understand like snow and evaporation and all of that stuff. So I really want to make sure that I hit like this temperature scale made me remember that in sixth grade for these kiddos this year. I want to make sure that I hit the Kelvin scale you know, um, Celsius and Fahrenheit and where they come from while I'm doing this thermal energy because that will really help them um, pick up some speed the next year when we're doing temperatures for weather and understanding how temperatures affect the, you know, water cycle and how that affects the weather. Phase change, freezing point. Okay, this is good because we just did all of these in um, states of matter. Celsius and Kelvin, and absolute zero. Bingo, that's what I need. Okay, let's see if I like the activity or not. I like this because it's going to give me the opportunity to go back to melting point, boiling point, freezing point, and phase changes. There are some of my students that had a hard time, even though they knew the definitions, identifying those things when we tested on that. So that will give me an opportunity to wrap that review and reteaching into this. All right, what do we need? 16 ounce to 20 ounce plastic bottles, one for each group, ice, small beaker. This is materials heavy. So my students are not going to be able to do this one at home. Here are my vocabulary words. Good. Draw a graph on the board, labeling the x-axis as thermal energy, the y-axis is temperature. Graphs, that's always good. Place an ice cube in a beaker, so now we're to the ice cube thing again. So I did not show them how, like, it goes across for a while as far as the temperature goes because the energy is going into the phase change. I didn't show that in graph form, and I've seen that on some of the release items before as a practice item. Okay, to me, this chemical formula for water... In the state of matter, I think this is including too many concepts at once, and it's going to confuse them. Um, I don't want to teach chemical formulas for things right now because even though it's good for them to have a, a like a basic knowledge of what that means, that's not what we're learning about. So I would say that that needs to be not the focus of this lesson. I never want to do direct instruction on too many concepts concepts at once in a lesson or my students are going to be confused at the end of the lesson about what they were supposed to know from that. Um, so I would separate that out. Okay, so I see the reason why they're doing that. They're trying to show that water is still water, it's just in a different form. So they're saying that the chemical form is H2O. So I guess what I could do is instead of having students do it, I could just do it really quickly and say, you know that the formula for that water is hydrogen and oxygen together and I could just draw it really quick. And then I could say, what do you think it is now? 
and I could draw it again. So I could point it out without having to like directly teach to students about the chemical formula for water. Like I don't want to make a big deal out of that. That needs to be like that. But a lot of times what I'll do is I'll find a piece of a lesson that I really like and I'll pull it out. So let me see if there's something that I can salvage from this because I, what I like about this is the temperature scales. I like talking about that to prep them for seventh grade weather. So somehow I'm going to work that in because it, it goes well here. Now they're talking about evaporation over rivers, lakes, and oceans, which also is a great lead in to seventh grade weather. Ooh, ooh, electromagnetic waves. Okay, review how, okay, what are we waiting on? We're waiting on, it says there's a five minute waiting period. Display a variety of different cups, ask students which would be best to hold the hot water, put it in there. Okay, so they're putting the hot water in the cups and then they're letting them sit for five minutes and they're checking temperatures. That wouldn't be a bad idea because then I could discuss how to use a thermometer properly. Have students draw the conclusion. So that could be a station. During the five minute waiting period, review how conduction and convection rely on particles to transfer energy directly. Okay, talk to them about radiation through electromagnetic waves. So it sounds like what I would be doing as the teacher is I would be teaching my electromagnetic waves in a station and as a new material and then I would have other students working on conduction and maybe I could find a convection one. That's what I'd like to do. Like maybe all the other students that aren't doing the station, like hands-on station, could do like notes on the temperature scales. I have a really good temperature scale um, notes. Let me think how I did that. I think it was a PowerPoint that I saved it under. Let me look. Temperature versus heat. Yes, this is it. I liked this. Qualitative and quantitative. Yes. This is nice because it talks about heat and um, coffee. And then they're going to go to the station and do the um, activity with the different kinds of cups to see which one holds the heat best. So that's kind of cool. Okay, this explains how the thermometer works. Okay, this is the one. So um, I think I'll have them do, ooh, this is nice, physical properties. That's going back to what we learned in matter that depend on temperature. So that makes a connection between prior learning. And then this is like a summary slide and then conversions, which gets a little bit, I don't know if they could do that or not. There's an online converter that you can do. Okay, so that's it. So, independent student station, um, students working on temperature notes, temperature versus heat notes, and all the scales of temperature. Then um, I'll have to have some sort of a fill-in, maybe a doodle notes or something that students have to complete um, while they're doing this. Then maybe I could do something with um, the hot plate close to me. And how long does it take to do this or that? Maybe water's a good one. And then I'm teaching about electromagnetic waves and radiation. So maybe what I could do is have Okay, so at a time, I might have like 15 kids in my class, I'm thinking, for sixth grade. Um, hold on, let me look really quick. I'm going out of my screen share so that I can look at my students' names without you looking at them. All right, so for this class, this class is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16. If all of my students came, there would be 16, but I know there is at least two of those kids that are not going to be coming back right away, um, possibly more. So if I had 15, it's set up for 15, that would be good. In a small group, I like to work with like three kids right now. I think that's the most that I could work with and be socially distanced. Um, maybe 
four kids if I had them at two tables. That will work. I have to see what the restrictions are now and if we still have to be six feet apart or if we could just be like a relaxed six feet like social distance you know if it's more like four to six feet then it would be easy to get four so if I had 15 kids if let's say I had four of them working with me um, then I've got 11 kids left right so if I had one with the hot plate and then I had two doing the um, cups one and so that's three so that's 11 minus three so we've got eight left the eight kids could be doing notes and then we switch them out and then if they get finished I could have um, them go to Legends of Learning have you ever done Legends of Learning before? I love Legends of Learning. So um, this is free. At least it's free as long as you don't have too many things at once, which I just always delete out my games when I get to that point. Um, you have a free login that you create as a teacher. You saw, I use my school Gmail to sign in. And there are playlists. And so you find games, and then like for this, this is a weather playlist that's showing down here. Forecaster, floating spheres, weather prediction, forecast live, and reading weather maps. So those were four uh, activities that I set up, and I just put the playlist on there, and then students can play through those um, when they are done with their regular assignments. So I think that if I have eight students at a time that are working on notes, no more than eight, then I can have the rest of the students working on stations and one of those stations would be me. I think that would work. That would spread the students out well enough. The notes are going to take twice as long as a station. Um, so that would work well. So they stay at, this, at the, the notes for two stations and then they move to the other stations and then flip-flop and then I would have to figure out how I was doing my rotation. Um, so yeah, that's what we would do. So we're kind of breaking the class in half. Half the class will be working on notes and half the class will do, be doing stations, one of which is my station. Okay, so this will last two days at least. It might last three days. So that would be when we come back. We have an online textbook the students are playing around with insulator materials, and then we're going to have a post discussion on Monday. So that takes care of Monday. So I think what I'm going to have them do afterwards is have them actually dig into the book work, and then we'll come back and do some more hands-on to solidify it when they come back to school. Um, the first day that we come back, we're going to have to obviously do procedures um, and I don't know how much I'm, uh, since I'm going to be having them do some things that involve heat, we're going to have to do our lab safety um, mini unit, my lessons on lab safety, which I should have done at the beginning of the year, but I couldn't because we started virtual. And then when we came back, we never did anything that required like any safety procedures. Like all they were doing was pouring some things in layers in a glass for density and dropping candy in like oil, water, and I mean there wasn't anything really. I gave them some basic directions. But if we're going to use the hot plates, um, we're going to use hot water, things like that, I definitely need to do my safety and that will just be part of procedures when we come back. So plan for next week. Monday is covered. It's the recap and discussion on what they already did with their design. Then we'll go to the Think Central, which is the Houghton Mifflin um, Science Fusion textbook. This is the teacher side. I love this um, textbook, actually. It's, I think, the best science textbook I've ever worked with. After the students do their initial discovery assignment, then I want to come back and do some direct instruction. And I'm going to use the uh, digital lessons to do that. So let's take a look at, oh, this is the student access. I want the teacher access. Let's go to, see if I can find direct instruction for 
thermal energy. Okay, this is what we just finished. Introduction to energy. Temperature, thermal energy, and heat. And there's the effects. Those are the things I need to do right now. We've are, I think that we don't need to do this right now. Um, but let me look at it really quickly. So if I click on this. I go to Lesson Student Resources. I can watch the digital lesson. You're getting to preview Houghton Mifflin. Today, many mental health problems are manufactured in the machines, but not so long ago, nearly every village and town had a crisis. Yeah, I know. This is seventh grade. Hold on. I have a student calling me. I'm going to need to pause. Okay, so that was one of my students. Um, today, if I haven't told you already, is an asynchronous day. My eighth graders are working on an essay test um, that I gave them, and I assigned specific things. In fact, I'll show it to you. Um, it's a performance assessment. Since they've just taken the check-in, I didn't want them to have to do another test over the same thing. So instead, I gave them a structured um, essay and then what I did this last week was I went over each day an example of how to write this one paragraph at a time so here is my um, first week beginning on Monday the 8th um, I'm just showing you the sixth grade right now on Monday I told you that we were going to um, Take a look at their ice cube insulators that they created for the don't melt the ice. Um, but I am not going to be able to actually work synchronously with students because I just remembered that I have a um, training from 9 to 10 about the North Carolina School Improvement Plan grant. Um, so that means that I'm going to leave a video for students. So this weekend um, I'll have to prepare this video and make sure that I put it in an announcement for students um, and email them to make sure that they're aware uh, that we're not meeting in a Zoom. So they're just gonna work on their um, lab report, so I have to create that. So that's an action item, the video and the lab report for them to fill in about what they did. And then on Tuesday, which will be the 9th, um, they're gonna go in and do their digital lesson, which was on temperature, which I was showing you earlier before I got cut off um, in our online textbook. And basically they go in and um, click through, listen to the directions. It's like drop and drag and things like that. I just have to create that on um, their basically login list so that when they go into their things to do list on their online textbook, it will show. And um, what I'm gonna do is for these two days, they're gonna be doing a different digital lesson each day. The first day will be on what temperature is, and the second day will be on thermal energy and heat, which goes over conduction, convection, and radiation. Um, so I'm gonna give them one sheet for both of those days to fill in vocabulary. So that'll be my um, basic assessment um, for DOK1. And then this one right here um, on Thursday and Friday, I'm gonna have them make a foldable paper book, um, which they'll have to illustrate conduction, convection, and radiation, which is um, basically how they'll be assessed on that, um, on any kind of EOG. So then um, coming to the next week, which will be the 15th, that's the day before we go back in person, um, I'm going to have them do breakout rooms and read their books to partners. And then I'll give them a little like quizzes game or Kahoot game that they can open up while we're in the breakout um, or in the session, Zoom session, and then they can play it on their own um, for their you know, asynchronous work that day. And then um, any questions that they have about going back to school face-to-face, -face, I'm gonna answer them during that class. So then we come back, first day back, face-to-face um, -face on the 16th of February. I'll go over procedures again and lab safety, do my lab safety lesson, which I can show you in another video. On Wednesday the 17th, we're going to start our stations and that will take two days. So Wednesday and Thursday are our face-to-face -face days. 
Um, and then Friday is an asynchronous day, which I'll give them a quizzes to do on their own to go over what they've learned. But um, we talked a little bit about the stations before. They're gonna do something with a hot plate and conduction, like heating something up. Um, and I'll refine that later. And then the thermal energy, um, using different types of cups to keep hot water hot that I found on the NC, um, go open NC that I was showing you earlier. And then the electromagnetic waves teacher led lesson, which I have to come up with how I'm going to teach absorption, scattering, and temperature change. But those are my three parts of that lesson that I will have to work out before um, Wednesday. So that'll take two days to get everyone through all that. And then we should be pretty good on, um, on this unit. So... I'm hoping to just give a quiz. Um, well, actually, honestly, the quizzes that I'm leaving them on Friday should be able to suffice for that. And then I can just move on the following week to a new um, shorter unit before I do my big heavy hitter that talks about um, the crust of the earth and tectonic plates. So I hope that wasn't too many pieces and parts for you. When I plan, um, I'm like a whole, like a big picture person. So I'm like kind of all over the place and I have lots of different things going on. Um, but hopefully you got some ideas that you can use. And if you're a more like holistic, like big picture person like I am, hopefully this was helpful to you today. I have marker all over me now. Ah, the um, joys of being left-handed. Um, but I, I hope that something that I said will spark an idea for you and I will leave you the materials down in the description box in case you'd like to use this in your own thermal energy unit in your class um, but everyone have a great day and wherever you are don't forget to work hard be kind and amazing things will happen